Rub up your engines! Matt Moe says, I have a 1986 Ford Ranger. I parked it a few months when I jumped it. I had the polarities wrong. Do you think the battery's toast? They're not made to be sitting for long periods of time, but you did more damage than that. If you reverse a polarity and jump it, and you turn that key on, it could have fried all kinds of stuff. Could have fried the alternator, could have fried the main computer, the PCM, blown a bunch of fuses. Start by checking all the fuses and all the wires coming off the battery to see if any of them melted or if any of the connectors got fused used from having the wrong power. You never want to do that. Always look at a battery, see which says plus, which says minus. All batteries somewhere on there. They might be dirty. Clean them up first. Plus sign for the positive terminal and a negative slash for the negative. Never reverse charge them or you can do all kinds of damage to it. At least it's a 96. On a modern car, it can do thousands and thousands of dollars of damage. On those, it usually does a lot less because they're a lot less computerized than any modern cars. They still have computers on them, but nothing compared to the new ones. Joseph Festolore says, quick question, do you know what could be the problem for my car? Got a forerunner, reaches a quarter of a tank or 80 miles left, it'll stall out while I'm driving like it's out of gas. Replace the fuel pump, the fuel sock that goes to it inside there, and all the rubber hosing that's inside the gas tank. What's happening is it's starting to get weak. When you get low on gas, any crud in the tank will get sucked in, and when you got a full tank of gas, you got all that weight of gas feeding the fuel pump, and when it gets low, it doesn't, so just replace the fuel fuel pump and the sock filter and all the rubber parts. It's 14 years old, so, you know, the rubber can be getting rotten inside the gas tank, too. So just replace all the rubber parts in the pump and that pre-filter sock, because you got to change it all when it get to that old. Alan Xavier says, Scotty, I spilled some oil on my engine bay when I was adding oil. I can't get the sum of the oil on the bottom. Will it be fine? Sure. You know, uh, oil actually keeps metal from rusting. A little grease and oil actually keeps things from rusting and falling apart. You don't want to get oil on electrical parts. You don't want it soaking wiring harnesses. You don't want oil on your alternator, on your starter. But it's just on parts and it's not dripping on the ground. Eh, no big deal. If you can't wipe it off, can't reach it with a cloth and wipe it off, it isn't going to hurt anything. It can actually keep things from rusting a little bit. But if it's on electrical parts, yeah, get some spray electrical cleaner and spray all that area with that. And the spray electrical cleaner won't hurt the electronics, but it will dissipate a bunch of the oil if you spray a bunch of it on. And then it all evaporates and nothing happens anyway. So you might want to do that if it's near electrical parts. Crazy Penguin says, what are your thoughts on a Dodge Challenger? Those are stupid. Stinking fast vehicles. Unless you get one of those Hellcat V8 engines, they are fast. They burn out like no tomorrow. But the Dodge products. They do not hold up, they don't hold their value, and they fall apart when they age. Those doubly so, because they're so fast, most guys drive the heck out of them, and then if you buy a used one, pfft, it's falling apart in front of your very eyes. Now, if you're the type of guy, you don't mind the price, you want a speedy vehicle like that, go ahead and buy one. It's your money. Just realize it's going to be worth nothing when you finally decide to sell it. And since they make so many of them, you know, they make tons of them, it'll never really be a collector's item like the older ones were, 60s and 70s, so don't think it's going to be worth money, but if you want speed and you don't mind spending that kind of money and loss of resale value, go ahead and get one if you're a speed freak. Ashton Johnson says, what's your take on a Suzuki? Okay, if you're talking about motorcycle, they make some of the best motorcycles, race bikes, I mean, they really make great motorcycles. Their cars, eh, they pulled out of the United States decades ago because of sales were so bad, because they were puny little cars that Americans didn't like. The rest of the world where gas costs more, they get good gas mileage. I know people in Australia drive them, people in the West Indies drive them, and they're little Suzuki sidekicks. They're cute little jeepy things. They don't last forever, but some guys like them. But here in the United States, they were a massive failure as a brand. Jonathan Alvarado says, I have a 1988 GMC Sierra that overheats but doesn't lose radiator fluid. Why? All right, it's overheating. It's not losing radiator fluid. First, change the thermostat. If the thermostat's stuck shut, it'll overheat because it's coolant's not going through the system. If the water pump isn't working, it's not pumping. It'll overheat, but you won't lose any coolant. Now, of course, if you drive a car any period of time and it's overheating, it's going to lose coolant because it's going to start boiling stuff out. But pray it's just a bad thing thermostat, pray maybe the water pump's broken, but you're going to lose coolant over time, or probably that the radiator's just all worn out and clogged up and you need a new radiator, because if you do drive any car that's overheating any length of time, it is going to eventually lose coolant, because it'll get too hot and it'll start bubbling out. Douglas Gomez says, is a Mitsubishi 3000 GT a reliable car? In one word, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> I've had customers with them, and I've had some customers that ages ago they bought brand new ones, they loved them, they had fun with them, then they started to wear out and they got rid of them, and I had other customers that bought them after guys like him got rid of them, had a hundred something thousand miles on them, they were endless money pits, their interference engines, and the timing belt would break, and the engines would be shot, and then they weren't going to spend five, six grand rebuilding the engine, they just got rid of them. They're good looking cars, they're sharp cars, and they were fast, but they're not reliable in their long run, especially if they had automatic transmissions. But they were fast cars, a lot of guys like driving them, but they're not a type of car you would ever want to buy used with high mileage and think it's going to last long. It'd make a good lawn ornament to park in your front yard and clean it up, but not as an everyday driver, that's for sure. Sean M says, which aftermarket direct fit catalytic converter would you recommend? Well, I'll tell you, I've had good results with Walker, that big muffler company Walker, and I have bought Walker direct fit cats for customers, and they always work quite well. Now, realize at least here in the United States, by federal law, they have to guarantee them. So, let's say you bought one, and you bolted it on, and it still wouldn't work right, they have to give you your money back by federal law, you'd send it back and they'd have to refund your money, so you're not gambling, at least in the United States, because if it does go bad, they got to give you your money back if it doesn't work, and the Walker company's a pretty good company, and every time I bought a Walker aftermarket direct fit cat, not the well done ones, but the ones that just bolt on, they work fine for my customers, so I pretty much stick with them, and they don't pay me any money either, so I don't think Scotty's a shill here. <laughs> I don't know anybody at Walker. I mean, we used Walker mufflers when I was a kid. I had grandfather's garage. Anthony Padilla says, Scotty, what's the best way to clean the valves on a GDI engine? Well, the absolute best way is to pay a mechanic like me. We have special machines just for cleaning GDI engines. It's like a four-step process using a very expensive machine that costs about 2500 bucks and some very complex chemicals, and not just one set of chemicals, a bunch of different ones at different times you use different chemicals. Now, if you want to try it yourself, Yourself. There are GDI cleaners that you can spray into the intake, and they work okay. You could try that. I got a video on that. GDI valves on an engine, Scotty, and it'll show you the video, and you'll show how easy it is to spray the stuff in. Give it a try yourself. But we mechanics have machines that do it a really well job. They're computer controlled. They're not just guessing by squirting some stuff in. So that's the absolute best. But you go watch my video and buy a can of the stuff. It's like eight, ten bucks for the can. Give it a try and see what happens. Denzel Crocker says, Says, what is the best first car? Okay, the best first car is a car that doesn't cost much and doesn't break. <laughs> Depends if you're talking new or used. If you're talking used, I'd say go out and get an older Toyota Corolla or Toyota Camry if you want a little fancier one. The Camrys are a lot fancier. You get a better ride. They both can last a really long time. You're going to save money getting an old used one. Maybe you're going to wreck it. Who knows what's going to happen, right? But if you're talking new, I would say just stick to like the Corolla because it's somewhat lower priced car. I wouldn't go even lower ones because then they're not as well made. A lot of times they're not even made by the company like the cheapest Toyota really isn't a Toyota. It's made by Mazda. You want to get the company that actually makes it. They're better cars, not one that they farm out from somebody else. And I just say Toyota Corolla. My son just bought one. He's really happy with it. It wasn't his first car, of course, but it's the first car he paid his own full price for. So... <laughs> Stan the man says, Scotty, have you ever worked on Detroit diesel two-stroke, 71 or 92, and what do you think of those old Greyhound buses and such? My grandfather's day, I did when I was a real young mechanic. We had customers with them. They were solid-built engines. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Of course, the problem with the two-stroke engines are is they pollute more, and when you got a diesel engine that pollutes more anyway, and then you make it a two-stroker, whoo, they can pollute. Now, they do put out more power, which is the main reason they built them. I mean, I've been in boats, and they had dual Detroit diesel two-stroke engines in them, and they were turbocharged, and they had two-stroke diesel engines in them, and it made for fast boats with dual engines in them and dual props. But, you know, the day of the two-stroke diesels, they're, they, they're probably pretty well numbered because of the pollution that they put out. It's not going to be able to accept any of them. The diesels are bad enough, but when you had a two-stroke diesel, are going to have problems. Plus, you can't really put any kind of catalytic converter system on on a two-stroke diesel. The diesels now do have anti-pollution things, catalytic converters and stuff, special types that burn stuff, but a two-stroke one couldn't because the oil would clog them up, so, you know, it's kind of a thing of the past now. Gary Wood says, if you're 66 and my dad is younger and you have that much hair, I don't know what to say. 
<laughs> That's just genetic. Let me tell you. My great grandfather died in his sleep when he was 95 years old, and he had a full set. He had more hair than me, but it was all gray. It was totally gray. That's just pure genetics. There's nothing you can do about that. You know, I mean, I'm sure they got all these hair saving nonsense that people have and transplanted hair and all that stuff, but that's just pure genetics. It's the luck of the draw. You know, I know guys who went bald when they were 29 years old. Like I say, my great grandfather was 95 and he still had all the hair on his head, so. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.